Hi, I'm Kara, life coach, wife, and mom to four incredible and unique children. It wasn't all that long ago that my son received a diagnosis that had my world come crashing down. I lacked the ability to see past the circumstances, which felt impossible, and the dreams I once had for my life and family felt destroyed. Fast forward past many years of surviving and not at all thriving, and you'll see a mom who trusts that she can handle anything that comes her way and has access to the power and confidence that once felt so lacking. I created the Special Needs Mom podcast to create connection and community with moms who find themselves feeling trapped and with no one who really understands. My intention is to spark the flare of possibility in your own life and rekindle your ability to dream. This isn't a podcast about your special needs child. This is a podcast about you. If you are a mom who feels anxious, alone, or stuck, then you are in the right place. Welcome. Hello and welcome back to the Special Needs Mom Podcast. Today's episode is a guest interview, specifically a guest interview with Angela Todd. I will say that I actually recorded this yesterday with her and the conversation was one that left me wanting about 10 more conversations. I feel like there was so many areas that would have been interesting to dive in with her. And so today is a sampling and I think there's going to be more to come because I just don't think we were done with the conversation. Angela introduces herself as an archivist, a historian, and activist. Now, if that doesn't have you intrigued, I don't know what would. Generally, you can already tell by how she describes herself. She's a very interesting person. And like you and I, she's a special needs mom. And so she's actually a really great example of somebody that brought her passions and just desires prior to having a child and incorporated who she was before with the challenges of raising a child with special needs and is now living and fulfilling, kind of bringing it all together. Her child's a little bit older, but I feel like she has so much to share and so much wisdom. And she has a free resource that she's offering to everybody uh, from this episode. And I encourage you all to check it out. As per usual, the conversation with Angela dives deep quickly. So get ready to listen to another mother and listen to your own story within hers. I'm pleased to welcome Angela Todd. Angela, I'm so thankful to have this conversation. I'm not totally sure where it's all going to go today, but I'm mostly excited for that. Thank you so much for being my guest today. I've been a fan for quite a while. I'm really thrilled to be here. Okay, so let's get started with a question I ask every guest, and it is give us a picture of your journey and your experience with being a special needs mom. Well, I am one of those women that's done it all and not necessarily in a good way. So I did <laughs> fertility treatments for like five or six years, and that really broke that relationship. And in my next relationship, we got pregnant right away, and my son came at 24 weeks. Wow. And so that was not what we were prepared for. And I was 39 when I had him. So I feel like, whew, what a journey it's been. He was in the neonatal intensive care unit for three months. And after two weeks of that journey, my mate, Cliff, and I were taken into a small room. They closed the door behind us and said, it's time for us to talk about withholding life support. Mm -hmm. So that wasn't at all where I had dreamed of my family. You know, I wanted to be that hippie mama where all the kids came over and you know, we ate out of the garden all the time and it was all, <laughs> you know, what you imagine hippies would do. It really didn't work out that way. We, of course, refused to withhold life support. And I was doing research at the time on the history of science. And so I had all this information that I thought at my fingertips about how long it takes to get experiments to become facts and all this stuff. And I was really angry at the doctor's because they were trying to protect me from a really difficult situation. But I thought I knew a lot. And 
I might have embarrassed myself at that moment. I remember really just yelling and screaming that, you know, what they were telling me couldn't possibly be the latest information. You know, they didn't realize how far my journey had started previous to that moment, right? All the shots and the broken relationship and all that. So they, I'm afraid they got it with both barrels, but it was, I don't know how deeply to go because for me, it can be a little triggering to recall it all. Luckily it's been a while, but he did have grade four and grade two brain bleeds. He had sepsis he had jaundice, which was like nothing compared to the other <laughs> things. And somehow we made it through that. He was then in a transitional hospital for three weeks where they taught us to care for him, really. So bathe him around his oxygen tube. He was on a pulse ox and when he would desat in the night, his oxygen would dip low and we were supposed to rouse him or wake him up. Mm-hmm. And I'm pretty high strung, naturally. Mm-hmm. So the journey through the waiting and hoping of infertility and then the like month in the hospital and then this early birth did not help me be the cool hippie mom that I had always (laughs) dreamed of being. They finally let us go after three weeks. His beloved nurse said, well, you could have gone home a week ago, but we didn't think you parents were ready. No way. That's so funny. Not funny, funny, but... (laughs) Well, it is now because it's over, but I do thank them for that because I was really beside myself. So it's been a long road. He's 19 and I actually really hate how people tell this story of like, and now he's great, Mm. right? Because it erases so much hard work. He did a lot of hard work. We parents did a lot of hard work. My parents, our extended family, our friends. And therapists, our house was filled with occupational and speech and physical therapists. We had a reading specialist come, developmental, a developmental department followed him through the hospital where I had him. There were people in and out of our house all the time. And it's amazing, I guess, the way that can be coordinated around a single child. It is amazing. And I think I would love to hear how you coped with that. I don't have that experience personally of people being in my home, but many of my clients and listeners of this podcast do. What was your experience like of that? And how did you cope with that? Well, I'm from New England. And so I made a pot of coffee and played the hostess and welcome to my home and (laughs) really exhausted myself trying to offer them cookies. And in fact, I have a very good friend who has similar experiences with a really different diagnosis. And we laugh all the time about how that definitely gendered, maybe sort of New Englandish waspy hostess thing comes out, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'm trying to be a good student and a good hostess and show that I'm a good mother. I guess because we didn't know, we didn't know why he came early. And so I wanted to show that I was a good mother. So it sounds like like you found some responsibility for him not going full term. Yeah, I definitely felt it. You know, there was a point where, oh, I'm used to having a beer before bed and we were somewhere and somebody said, oh, one beer won't hurt. And I said, no. And in retrospect, I'm so glad because it would have been the greatest opportunity for me to blame myself, Mm -hmm. right? And the mystery was never solved. Where are you at now with blaming and taking responsibility for that? So I feel like this conversation just uncovered something I need to deal with, actually. (laughs) Hmm. Isn't that interesting how simple conversations can help us shed light on things that we might not have been aware of before? Yeah, definitely. And your podcast is great for that, if, if I do say so. You know, one of the things that you said when I first started listening, you said the word worry is both a feeling and an activity. And that, you know, worry is my love language. So <laughs> it's my love language. that I think that's a quotable. That's very good. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my well, that's my feeling about it, right? Is I feel worried and I do worry and I hope that I did the best that I can. It's a little easier now that he's older. 
when he was younger, those first few years, especially, there was a lot of, you know, laying awake at night trying to relive those 24 weeks to figure out, you know, what I had done wrong or thinking about fertility treatments and did that set me on this path or, you know, it's a lot. Yeah, it is a lot. But what happens to a lot of people is we, kind of take on the position of being a victim of things instead of being responsible. Like, and I'm not looking at like, oh, I'm responsible. I pay my bills. I'm looking at kind of how you relate to yourself as being, um, having agency in, in leading your life versus having something happen to you. I think that is the question of all questions, really. And it's got to be a kind of a balance in a way. Well, it is a balance, right? What I hear in your kind of just recounting of kind of the questions you're asking yourself is it occurs over here as you were taking responsibility for something that likely wasn't yours to take responsibility over in the sense of like, it doesn't sound like based on the facts that I've heard, you had any responsibility in having a a baby that came at 24 weeks. And so I think it's like we swing from either um, side of the pendulum, either not taking responsibility for what is our responsibility mm-hmm. or would serve us. And then you're on the other side and sounds like taking responsibility for something that isn't yours to take. It was a struggle. And, you know, this is a sensitive topic for a lot of women, but a couple of years after my son was born, we got pregnant with a daughter who didn't make it. Mm-hmm. And she came two weeks earlier than he did. So she came mm-hmm. at 22 weeks. Mm-hmm. And that actually, wow. I mean, it was awful on one hand and it showed on the other hand that it was probably not something I did. Right. Like there's, I had a cervical incompetence. I had this, I had that. And yeah, I think what just struck me though is the way that you said probably not something I did. Darn you, Kara. <laughs> yeah. Right. Where obviously probably not in this conversation, but maybe in a, in a conversation we can have in the future is what would it look like to fully surrender your responsibility of your pregnancies in a way that actually just felt good for you? It felt healing. And I, I don't want to say forgiving because it doesn't sound like there's anything to forgive, but right. maybe when we, when we become like the coachy word for it is become complete of something that happened in the past, the mm. energy of that thing doesn't hold us anymore. And it doesn't sound like you're staying up at night now thinking about this, but it sounds like there's that probably that just has a little bit of a foothold and not being able to close the door and really have peace about what happened, what happened to your children. Yeah. Oh, you are laser focused girl. That's a really good point. Really good point. So I have, I'm not going to use my son's name because he doesn't want me to, but <laughs> my daughter that passed was Clara. And I do think and talk about her a lot. She, she came on Valentine's day mm. and I, I didn't realize until this conversation, how much closure with my son that I got from having my daughter. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like it did give you a lot of access. It got you to the, it probably wasn't my fault which is significant. Yeah. And then I'll wrap up by saying we got pregnant one more time and I did a fish oil intervention and uh, a hormone intervention. (laughs) She was full term. Well, look at that. Look at Uh that more evidence to be like, Oh, interesting. (laughs) There was something biologically outside of my control or awareness, right? Cause you were not aware that there was an issue. Um, Wow. And I'll say too, that medical protocols have changed since then. So my first micro preemie, I was with my regular OBGYN and they said, sure, if you want to try again, go ahead. My regular OBGYN. And I lost that child. And then finally for the third one, they said, you better hit the high risk doctors this time. And I don't think they wait for that second early pregnancy anymore. 
Yeah. And didn't you say, did you say that you're 39 when you had your son, your oldest? Mm -hmm. Which I also, was... I mean, like I had a, what is it called? A geriatric pregnancy myself. And so I think you were already in the high risk category Oh yes, over the age of 35. So mm -hmm. Yes, I think you're right. Protocols have very much changed. And even I look at like the last 10 years of my son's journey, the treatments available for his tumor type were very different. Even the way that they categorized it, it was kind of like, is it cancer? Do we call it a brain tumor? What are we going to, what are we going to call this thing? Because in some cases it acts like cancer in some cases it doesn't. And in the last 10 years, they're like, nope, nope, it is. This is what we're calling it now. It's weird growing a little older now. I'm like, wow, like 10 years doesn't seem like that long, but yeah. there's so much that can happen in 10 years. Even I look at my cell phone, this is a very funny and not that important thing, but I look at the cell phone I had during our stay in the hospital 10 years ago. And I was a little resistant to change. I will admit that, but it was like <laughs> some, it was not a Bluetooth, not Bluetooth. What do they call those? Blackberry. But it was some version of that where I had like the keyboard on the thing. I love that phone. Uh, it was not fancy. And during the hospital stay, it got flooded in my purse. Like my water bottle opened in my purse. And so like I found my phone like swimming in water. Not ideal. And anyhow, so I don't know how I got started on, the, on this. But anyhow, like so a lot changes. I look at my phone now and it's like a little baby computer with like 25 camera lenses on it. And um, it's like very different than the phone uh, I had 10 years ago. So I want to jump on that for a minute because I mean, I had one of those little flip phones when my son was in the hospital and they're, you know, those tiny little, like almost mini Polaroids are not that clear. The pictures yes. that it took. Yes. When I lost that camera, it was an elaborate process to email each individual picture to myself, blah, blah, blah. Nowadays, of course, everything's automatically backed up to Shutterfly or Google or something like that. And the archivist in me wants to tell everybody, if you don't have that hooked up, hook it up on your phone so that everything's backed up outside of your phone. Because I lost so many pictures when I got rid of that phone and I never will again. Yes. I desperately need help when it comes to like managing photo management. I think most people do. I don't think I'm alone in this. I want to touch on how you call yourself. You say, I'm an archivist, historian, and activist. I'm like, wow, that sounds so intriguing. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about these roles or this identity that you have. So when I was going through infertility and getting pregnant with my son, I worked at a botanical archive at a top university. And I worked as an archivist for 18 years. When I got there, they were using a card catalog. So to do botanical research, you had to look up Fernald, Arnold, and you'd find all his information. So there was no way with a card catalog, for example, to look for women or African-American botanists or whatever else you were looking for. So I spent a lot of those years working with database designers to try to get a different kind of platform, which would allow us to have different kinds of knowledge. They were overdue and I was there at the right time. I don't think I'm a brilliant database designer, but I am a pretty good researcher. And I would say, how are we going to figure out like all the women in mycology or how are we going to figure out if there are natives doing botany in the Bahamas, right? So a we work to make the information available in different ways. So it was really troubling also to really dive into the history of science in a modern way and mm -hmm. see that when universities started offering women botany degrees, they'd go, they'd graduate, then they'd marry a botanist because the bottleneck then moved from women not being able to get the education to women not actually being able to get hired. Mm. So they'd be secretaries or wives. And there were so many wives typing up dissertations and sorting plant seeds and all that and really doing that work. But because they weren't employed as botanists, mm -hmm. they didn't get included, like just because of that reason. So that's one of the many things in my past that has set me on this mission to get women into the historical document. I'm picking up that I think your brain might be really, really really good at what it does. And 
it's exciting to tap into such different kind of conversations than that, that I normally do in my everyday life. To bring it forward, Kara, that's my life, right? I was in academic research. I was, uh, my undergraduate degrees in women's studies. I was on this mission. I had my son. I started um, seeing all these women leaving their jobs to start their own businesses. By then I had had my two daughters and I was like, I'm going to do it. And I started off being a feeding specialist and it was actually just the problem we had at the moment, not the thing that sets my heart on fire. And so after a couple of years of that, I thought, ah, oh, it's really the women's history part. And so in this time, my dear Aunt Joyce had done our family genealogy. And I opened it up and there was my son. Blah, blah, blah. First name, middle, last. And the date he was born. And that was it. And I thought, oh, well, that's not my son. You know, my son has this dramatic backstory, a life mm -hmm. or death, mm -hmm. so much work, blah, blah, blah. And so for the last couple of years, I've been working on a program to walk moms through the process of saving their special kids' history. In part, of course, because nobody else is going to do it. So a lot of our kids won't hit those traditional markers that genealogy websites pick up, you know, mm -hmm. marriage and jobs and this and that, or the public records that we leave behind. I'm still exploring this. We were a mission family for the March of Dimes for many years. Mm -hmm. I have no idea if we're in their archives or not, you know, and if you've done that kind of community work, that's a lot of work the marches and the fundraising and the conferences and that sort of thing. And I feel like our community of moms is one of the most hidden communities of moms. Wow. Say that again. I do feel very strongly that our community of moms is one of the most hidden communities of moms. And I almost think that's part of our job, right, is to make it so that our kids can fit in, our kids can be served, our kids can move forward. And there's so much, at least for me. I'm sure you've heard me say that many or talk about the occurrence of how often I hear moms telling me that they feel alone. Yes. And so I Definitely. think you're if you're saying like one of the most hidden. And so what I want your perspective on why you think, what creates that? What creates the, besides what you already mentioned? Well, this goes back to our talk about responsibility versus <laughs> feeling like a victim. And I think it's both, right? In some ways, we are too, excuse my language, damn busy to advocate for ourselves, to go talk to our representatives, to, you know, at some point I stopped being a mission family for the March of Dimes because I had another kid. I wanted to keep my job on and on. So there's that part of it, but there's also, there's no place for us. The PTA mm -hmm. is all typical moms. So we go to the playground. It's just all typical moms. The places for us are like in your community there's not, you know, structurally, we're not included yet. So what comes up for me is a little bit of a fighter in me is there is no place for us yet in the Definitely. sense of like, there's no special needs moms on the PTA until there are in the sense of right. like, we step into that. But you've also hit on the dynamic though, that from a bandwidth perspective, most of us our capacities are pretty maxed out as far as tending just to the basics of what it takes to raise our children. And so stepping into roles that often are volunteer and putting ourselves on those, on those boards, that's where I think there's some gaps. And I think kind of a side note, but one of my friends who's not a special needs mom, but has a larger audience, she's an author she had kind of a Q and a, how people do on social media. And someone had asked her like, how can we 
uh, it was specifically, how can we make churches more accessible to special needs children? So she tossed mm-hmm. the question over to me. And so I had kind of thought about it. I'm like, oh, that's a good question. And I don't know the answer yet. I got some good, I put out some things as well, but as far as people to give up me feedback, but the thing that came up to me most was that this is a all community conversation. It has to shift from only special needs moms having the conversation to mm-hmm. all people. I see a parallel to the conversation around race in our country where for so many years, it was really only people of color saying, hey, there's an issue here and, and it's not working for us. So now all people saying, huh, something might not be working for everybody here. And it's, we're not there yet by any means as far as like actually having it shifted to where the responsibility is still, I think, very much on um, people of color or special needs moms to advocate for themselves and to speak up and to be the one. And I think it's going to take a, a societal shift to change it. And I think it starts with us talking about it. I could not agree more. And I don't, I want to come back to the balance between responsibility and feeling like a victim because I, I don't, I feel like I only said the responsibility part and I don't want to leave it in that. I don't want to leave the ball in that court because, you know, my friends who are special needs parents are fighting with Medicaid to get medicines covered. They are trying to get reimbursed for a talker for their child, you know, an iPad talker for their child. They're, trying to apologize to their boss for taking off so much time. You know, I have a friend who's a single mom who needs coverage. She needs help at home and hiring and firing is part of her job description as a mom. And I feel like that's the ways I see that we're not set up for success as special needs moms, because it's so hard to cover the basics, as you say. And I think you're right that talking with each other and talking out loud in public is a really important first step. And I'm not sure I would have had the bandwidth to do it when my kid was younger. Yes, you pinpointed all the exact struggles that real life special needs moms are having as far as just getting the basics covered. I was talking to a mom yesterday who's trying to coordinate care for her daughter from three different doctors that are in three different states. And really we're looking at a system that's not set up currently to actually allow the parent to be a collaborative person that holds a role in facilitating the care of their child for their child. And I think there's some gaps. There are definitely some gaps in how it's working. And I think, you know, we, we know these gaps, we know they exist, but we're still in process with creating a system that works. And, you know, so right now we have to deal with it until, until we do have that. So it's like, it can easily, I think kind of speaking to like, almost feeling the victim of it, it can easily feel like we don't have power. And I certainly know I get, I get tripped up all the time when I'm trying to navigate the healthcare system and feeling like I just don't have any power. And I just, it's, it's a very unpleasant experience. I want to put in there that you're, you're not alone. If you feel like a victim when it comes to the medical care system that we currently have. Definitely not. Definitely not. And it's inflexible. So as you were talking, I was thinking about the times and places that friends and myself have made those collaborations, right? So doctors in different states, you know how they're connected is through the mom. So she becomes a conduit for this conversation that they can't seem to have with each other. Yeah, exactly. And I think that in this conversation um, yesterday, I was talking about, because one of the things that I think is the gap is like when you have many different doctors from many different specialties, all kind of in the same pot, it's hard to make decisions, right? Like there's no clear leader or distinct flow of decision-making processes. And in business, we have this, right? You have hierarchical um, leaders and such. And so one of the things that we kind of looked at is like it parallel to like, it's kind of like when you have a text thread with a handful of friends and you try to make plans, (laughs) finding a date is impossible. Where do we want to go? 
you get kind of responses like, I don't know, I'm fine. What do you want? I don't care. (laughs) And like, nobody steps up to be the decision maker. And it's just the dynamic of when we're all peers, there's a, a leadership void. And so actually what I came up with yesterday was actually recognizing that one of the roles we can consider as a mother, or, you know, in some cases, the father will take this on is being the project manager. So interestingly enough, my previous career was in landscape, landscape construction, design, and all that. And I was a project manager. And so I can look at the parallels of like project managers often don't have direct reports, uh, but they're managing a project. They're managing and they were fully responsible for the completion, the successful completion of the project. They're financially responsible for it. And they're happy. They're responsible for the client being happy at the end result. And yet they don't have agency. They don't have financial responsibility over the subcontractors or even in some cases, employees don't report to them. So I think it's a really good parallel. I'll probably develop it even further to kind of develop language around who we want to be as leaders and mothers, but then also project managers to create the teams and the basically the decision-making processes for the care of our children. And I don't know, what are your thoughts on that with that kind of concept and some of the challenges that we have? Kara, I think it's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. The thing I'd want too is to have two-way communication, right? So when my son was working with an occupational therapist to learn how to brush his teeth, they had a relationship for a year and a half before he would let her in his mouth. And then he turned three and she left. So there's like a granularity that her job as an occupational therapist could have brought to the table, right? In terms of how we're going to structure his path through the system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'd want those subcontractors to be able to report back to the project manager and the moms. Well, I guess the moms are the project managers. Mm -hmm. Like there's got to be a way, reciprocal communication and maybe more fluid boundaries around systems. Well, I think a lot of it is that we come to the system, we'll just call it, and we don't necessarily recognize or acknowledge that we are the project manager. We'll just use that role for now. And so therefore we don't request communication back. We don't, we don't even like know what to ask for. You know, there's a saying, you don't know what you don't know. Right. And so I think that's why these conversations are so important is to be like, oh, oh my gosh. Like actually one of my favorite clients, she told me this, I've sold on the podcast before, but she's like, oh, I don't fill out forms at doctor's offices. It like blew my mind because I just wouldn't have thought of that. It's blowing mine right now. Well, I know. I love saying it because everyone's like, <laughs> what? And, and I've tried this a couple of times and the people at the, at the office are like, what? Like, oh, like what we have, you have to fill out the form. And so sometimes I'll just say, oh, I'm good. Thank you. I'll just kind of like pull the whole classic dumb blonde uh, thing. Oh, I'm good. Thank you so much. <laughs> and they're like, wait, what? And sometimes they're like, no, you have to. And I'm like, okay. And then it kind of gets controversial. I'm like, oh, this is not what I need. Right. And then I, now I just think, oh, I'll just take the clipboard And I'll just set it down next to me. Like, I don't have to do it. And you know what? It's interesting to me. Nobody ever asked about it afterwards. No one's like, oh, you didn't fill out the form. And I mean, I've only done this a handful of times now, but I just think it's one of those things that we don't, it's so easy for us just to kind of follow what's expected of us or what we're asked to do. And so I think we don't even think about other options that we have. And so that's, again, why I think these conversations are so important is to kind of to step out from what we thought had to be and to reverse it and recognize, okay, what's the end result we want? What do we want to create? And okay, well, what do we need to do and who do we need to be to create the result? I am grinning ear to ear. I love this conversation. I love this conversation because you're right. And and I don't think this is necessarily just special needs moms. I think we're all trained to different degrees to be subject in the healthcare system, right? To be not feel empowered or not have agency. 
it's big and it's messy and we don't know medicine and we don't know the systems, like you say. Very uh, much. You're so. onto something big here, girl. I know. I think so. I'm like, gosh, goes my um, okay. Well, we clearly can talk about a lot of things and I want to be mindful of time. And before we started recording, you touched on something that I thought was really interesting. And so I wanted to see if we can kind of shift gears and talk about, you had mentioned you had done some training with Brene or you, is it that you facilitate some of her training now? Which one is it? trained with a facilitator of hers. Wow. Uh, Well, I don't know if we're going to have full time to discover all that, but you talked about the, the concept of the language around being the special needs mom experience, moving from being described as PTSD Mm. to being more chronic. And you specifically mentioned because the, you know, the P of PTSD is post meaning that there was something that happened and it's no longer happening again. And this to me right now, even in this, in this season of my life, I'm really like, oh man, like the language here I think is important because I think many special needs moms, we experience trauma every day, some big, some small, but just like the experience of having the vulnerability of a child's health, not being stable my experience is that that's traumatic for my body. So I would love to hear you just talk a little bit more about that. Um, what thoughts come up for you and you know, what will you share? Well, trauma is a big topic right now, and I think it's finally getting its due. My dear friend, Nicole Lewis Kieber, makes a difference between small T trauma and big T trauma. And she says small T trauma erodes and big T trauma explodes. Mm -hmm. And so a new diagnosis or time in a hospital or, you know, having the doctors bring me into a room and close the door behind me, those are explosive moments. But those daily decisions about trying to get your child to eat or somebody was mean to him on the playground and you feel like, okay, this is wearing me down. I don't know how to, you know, deal with COVID or war or how do I explain to my kids other disabled kids in their class even or racial shootings or you know there are those like those things in the world that erode and erode and there are things specific around our kids right that can erode us that are not life or death but getting him to eat a protein felt like it in the moment <laughs> and partly that comes from having that big t trauma though right yes. it's the way they one can kind of invoke the other. Yeah. I love that. I have, I've heard of the big T little T before, but I have not heard of the explode or erode. And I think that is really helpful because I think for many special needs moms, it's both of them happening Mm -hmm. ongoing Mm -hmm. all the time. And I think noticing that the road for me, like what comes up for me is like, okay, no wonder why so many of us are so tired and recognizing that the energetic impact of these little T traumas. And of course the big T traumas, like it's significant, right? Like there's, it's not nothing happening. And it's like, even though they are our normal, it doesn't mean that there's not still an impact of them. Right. And so I feel like the word normal, I'm I'm done with that word. <laughs> I really am. So like sequential diagnoses, at some point, I feel like I did get diagnosis fatigue. And I, you know, I'm not sure. I feel like there were some things I could have followed up on with my other kid. <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm sure it's fine. Because it seemed like, okay, compared to what we've been through, this might just work itself out and I cannot do that again. Yeah. It's a little tough for me to admit actually, but I think that fatigue comes from the big and little traumas being ever present. Yes, definitely. Well, I relate to you a lot of, it's hard to admit some of the things that we look over in our children, whether it's our children with special needs or our, our other children 
right? Because, and I can think of some things, I won't name them just for my son's privacy, but some things that I have overlooked because it was too uncomfortable to yeah. really dig in and look at it. Like it, to me, I look at it when I look at it, I'm like, oh my gosh, that's a big thing. And I don't know how to do it. Right. And so interestingly enough, it's been real easy just to kind of let it go and let it go and let it go and not address it. Mm -hmm. One, I guess I want to put in though, like first off grace and compassion, even if you find yourself in the same shoes where you're like, Oh my gosh, I'm feeling so guilty because I haven't done this thing. Notice that the guilt is not producing you actually doing it. And so I want to put in here like that grace, kindness, compassion can help first get curious about like, well, what is it that you're scared of or trying to avoid that might have you go actually be willing to do the thing? So any thoughts or anything to add on that? I feel like capacity and bandwidth also are really being talked about a lot these days. And I wish we had been talking about it, you know, 19 years ago. And I feel like we can only do so much And there's a way in which we moms have to preserve ourselves first. And so there was a moment in which, I don't know, we were going for some vaccines or something. And the pediatrician said, you know, I feel a weakness on one side. Why don't you just hit the neurologist real quick for a (laughs) scan before we give the vaccines? And I was like, yeah, okay. Well, (laughs) I'm sure somebody listening has been to an emergency appointment at an urban pediatric neurologist. And I have to say, I could not follow up anymore after that. It was, Mm -hmm. you know, my other son was in the hospital with a collapsed lung and it was like, I, I can't follow through with this. I, I cannot do it. And it had to be okay in the moment. Like I just couldn't keep my job and do all the things. Mm -hmm. It had to be okay. We circled back later. I'm not saying neglect, but there was just, I couldn't unsee what I had seen and it was not a clean place. Mm -hmm. It was really a difficult experience. And I felt it was like big D and little T all wrapped up in one. What did it it, take for you to be able to give yourself that space and permission to be able to just say, I don't have this. I'm not doing this right now. Because it's distinctly different than neglect. Like there's not even a question here in my mind, but what did it take for you to give yourself full permission to do that? In the moment, I felt like I did not have a choice. Like Mm. I physically and mentally could not do it and tend to everybody's needs. Mm -hmm. And then there were the years of guilt about that. And now, you know, (laughs) 15 years later, I'm okay with it. Mm. I wish I could have been the superhero that so many moms are portrayed as, but I wasn't. Or maybe you were by, by acknowledging what you could and couldn't do. Oh, thank you for that. It takes tremendous strength to be able to have an honest conversation with yourself. And I think a lot of moms skip over that part. Like they, they're telling themselves something that's not true. Mm -hmm. And so when you're honest with yourself, I think it's like, it takes tremendous strength to do that. Well, I'm going to take that as a feather in my cap. Thank you. Yeah. I, I don't know if it was, you know, I don't think it really had anything to do with me. I think I just couldn't then felt bad and then got over feeling bad. And, and I think that's an okay path. You know, at, at the time I had never heard of coaching. I wish there'd been a special needs mom coach in my life at that time. I really encourage any moms listening to reach out to you because I feel like that could be so shortcutted rather than the years of guilt in between. Well, I agree. (laughs) Thank you for that. But um, no, I think that's the thing is like, I think, you know, coaching is something that can just help us not stay stuck for so long. Mm. Right. Where like, even if we look at just the, thank you so much for your, your openness and your just full on vulnerability from the first minute we started talking, but just like this little piece of like, oh, wow, like I might still be carrying some energy from you know, losing my child at 22 weeks in a pregnancy. 
like you said, like we're talking a lot about capacity and bandwidth when we're literally putting those stones in our backpack every day and marching out and trying to do our life with those and all the, you know, the little ones, the little pebbles, the sand, all the different pieces oh, yeah. that we might be carrying, then it's going to impact our bandwidth. Right. And so, yes, I'm a big proponent of taking a look and being curious and cleaning up what we can clean up so that we can feel better. Right. So it, it doesn't change the past, but it does have us change our relationship with the past with you being a historian. I would love to have your take on that, but we actually are getting short on time. I do want to say one more thing about yes. capacity because when we were talking, you said that you were a landscape designer in your past life. And I was a corporate slash academic archivist in my last life. One of the other reasons that I feel like it's important for us to keep an archive around ourselves and our kids is because there's this flood of women leaving corporate, leaving visible working jobs to take care of our special kids. And that's our work now. I mean, a lot of women have put the brakes on any kind of aggressive ladder climbing or they've left jobs or they've gone part-time and all the things that, you know, really impact the arc of your career. And I feel like as a historian, there's going to be somebody a hundred years from now going, huh, where'd all the women go? And so I feel like I want us to save our stories and the stories of our kids because it's this important, very important work. I mean, that sparks so many things that I would love to talk about the idea of where do all the women go. And I hope that that's not the case. I hope that there's a shift. What I think we are moving away from, and I think COVID has been very helpful in breaking mm-hmm. down. And it's, it's, when I say helpful, it's not been easy. It's been horrible, <laughs> but it's been breaking down the black and whiteness of what it looks like to work in like a nine to five at the office, this thing that this model that very much doesn't work for women in more cases than men. And I would say that doesn't work for special needs moms period because of the flexibility that we need to have to care for our children. And so I guess I hope that the system is broken (laughs) <laughs> in a way that it will never work so that we can rebuild it in a way that it yes. does work. So, I hope so. That is the gift of COVID. It showed us how the system wasn't working. Yeah. And I think even now, I think right now we're in this messy middle. We're like, it's still not working, mm-hmm. but yet we don't have a system that does. And so I think the conversations are all around well-being. So it's interesting. So a portion of, of my coaching work is with uh, corporate clients. And so it's not a different conversation. It is just around a different, different problems, if you will, but same coaching. And the things that keep coming up are uh, what I call being well-sourced, which is a way of saying, caring for yourself in a way that you have something to give. Yeah. Right? And just like, again, it's just things that were not working. Things are not working still. So Anything to add to that as we kind of close down this conversation and and wrap up this episode? I have one last thing, which is I would love to have you check out my website, which has a section on it about this program that I have called Writing Our Kids Into History. And it's a great way to, I have a freebie on my website where you can make a brag sheet about your kid as the first step towards building a historical collection around your child. And it's at bit.ly forward slash, all one word, your child's triumph. Oh, wow. I love the name. So we'll definitely have that link on the show notes. So thank you. And I would encourage anybody to like, go check that out and be curious about that. She describes it as this brag sheet around your special needs child. And I know I will be looking at it and Again, I was, I really I have so many more questions. So we'll probably have to have you <laughs> on again. Um, but for now, I want to honor the time that we have. And thank you so much for, gosh, just really intriguing conversation and for bringing all of yourself to this conversation and to who you are as a mother. 
Thank you. And thank you for pushing me to think about things like worry and being well-sourced. I really appreciate you, Kara. Well, thank you so much. I'm doing all the work over here myself. So we're all in this together. Okay, well, we'll see you on the next episode.